this uh, wonderful session on bonsers in ACL surgery. And uh, it's indeed a pleasure and honor uh, to be part of this. And this is uh, uh, sponsored by Biotech. And I thank them for this uh, organizing this file chart session. We have a wonderful faculty lined up, uh, right from Dr. the senior most uh, faculty with us, who is very renowned, Pan India, and Dr. Pimpri Karsar, and Dr. Raju Raman, and Sumyadeep Datta, and Nitin Balerao, and myself. And I want this to be more of an interactive session, so uh, let us, uh, the youngsters can feel, oh, sorry. Yeah, the youngsters can feel free to uh, discuss. I think ACL is one of the commonest surgery that is performed uh, by an orthoscopic surgeon. And uh, also one of the uh, uh, major surgery which shows a lot of revision rates uh, because of failures. And it is because of lack of understanding. It is not the skill. Most of the surgeons are skilled. But I think we need to see the whole umbrella, the whole gamut of ACL and associated injuries before we really go ahead and do. We are good in skills. We know where the tunnel should be. We know what the graph sizes should be, how to go about. But I think one misses the envelope of the ACL and associated injuries and we need to focus on that. And this is a wonderful session, I think. Uh, very interesting and we have wonderful topics lined up. So I'll, I'll, I'll be the open, opening batsman, but uh, what we can do is we can take the question answers at the end so the whole faculty uh, can answer the question and answers, you know, and they can add uh, to the discussion. So I'll start with the ACL with high grade pivoting laxity and it's a very, very uh, important topic and uh, this is one of the commonest causes of uh, ACL failures. So if you see this video, that's the mechanism. So it's the dynamic valgus and rotational forces. It's just not the anterior posterior forces that cause the uh, ACL tear. So there is a lot of rotational component that is involved and one has to understand the underlying biomechanics of this. And we'll see the video one more time for the juniors very quickly. Just see her left knee and there you go. That was a dynamic valgus internal rotation and a lot of rotational component and she had an ACL tear. Right. So. So one needs to understand that you may believe in the anatomic double bundle or not. It's a different story, but functionally there are two different bundles for sure. So the posterolateral bundle is the one which prevents the shifting, uh, the, the pivot shift and contributes to the rotational stability. So it prevents the internal rotation of the tibia in near extension. So it's tight in extension, loose in flexion. And if it is stone, it causes not only anterior translation, but the internal rotation of the tibia in 30 degrees of flexion. And one has to understand this concept. This is very, very important. The AM bundle is tight in flexion and it causes, uh, it, if it is stone, then it causes anterior translation in 90 degrees of flexion. So the PL bundle is more important. And that is what we do in extension. Most of the surgeons would fix their graft in extension uh, as far as an ACL is concerned if they are doing a single bundle. But in pivoting sport, then uh, it is uh, re really a double bundle game. Right, so how do we really test the pivot shifting or the rotational instability in an ACL? Apart from the entry drawers test and the Lackman's test, the Slocum's test also is very, very important and one should not forget that and I, I do that in my practice. But the pivot shift test is currently the most specific clinical test to detect ACL injuries. It helps in evaluating reconstructive techniques and making an algorithm for the treatment of these patients. And uh, and just for the benefit of the, 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 the juniors, I think the pure shift test is important and one has to know this test and not scare of this test. You want to do it in your clinic. If you take the patient in confidence, if you have enough practice over a period of time, uh, you can certainly do that without harming the confidence of the patient. But you can start with in the theater first under anesthesia and then gradually come into your clinic as well. But that gives you a lot of information. So just imagine the patient is lying down, that's the head end, that's the foot end of the patient, the right side is towards me. The lower end, uh, the, the foot end is held by my right hand. I'm inter internally rotating the tibia with a valgus stress. My hand is on the fibular head, giving a valgus and anteriorly translating the tibia. So to start with in extension, it is already subluxed. Because the ITB 
in that case is anterior now to the uh, center of rotation in the lateral uh, in the in the coronal plane and it is pulling it anteriorly in my hand is pushing in valgus the pivoting is displayed and the the starting position is the subluxation itself the moment you start flexing you'll hear a clunk and the reduction because now the itb has gone posterior to the center of rotation and it is now acting as a flexor and pulling it back into place so a pure shift test starts with extension already in sublux position and as you flex it goes into reduction and with a clunk so let us see how it is done under anesthesia so that is the left knee on your left is the foot end and there is a valgus inter rotation and you can feel i mean you can see that clunk that tuck it gets reduced now it is subluxed and again you flex and it gets sub again it reduces back to its position right now this is very important and it is also important not just to say a positive or a negative test but you have to grade it the ikdc gives a wonderful classification for grading grade 1 uh, grade 0 is normal grade 1 is a slight glide grade 2 you feel the clunk the one what i was demonstrating was the clunk and grade 3 is it clunks and as if it is going to lock into it unless you force it back it doesn't come back so grade 2 and 3 are the ones we are interested in and that is where we we comment clinically yes there is a big rotational component and one needs to address this so pivot shift testing is just not positive or negative but we have to grade this now how does this help it gives you a diagnostic algorithm now this is a very uh, complex figure however if you go through it once it is very interesting gontier et al very recent paper 2020 it tells you just three tests the lackman test the anterior dose test and a pivot shift test will give you clinically you can tell whether it is the anterolateral whether it is the pl bundle or the am bundle or whether it is a complete acl that is torn so you can with permutation combinations uh, go ahead and find for yourself clinically before an mri scan is done now what is more important in a lackman test is not only the grading 0 to 5 5 to 10 and more than 10 but it is the end point that is very very important so one has to understand whether it is a soft end point or a firm end point and that is more significant in a lackman's test and of course the pure shift test is more sensitive and more specific now what are the causes so what causes the pure shifts it's the acl tear with the secondary stabilizers so as an youngster the moment you see an acl tear mri says acl is torn clinically you find anterior dose is positive lackman's is positive uh, one misses the pure shift test or one does the pure shift test and does not elicit because of the spasm of the patient patient is not cooperative patient is anxious and you feel fantastic you go ahead and do an acl and after some time the patient comes to you with a retear so one has to look into the secondary stabilizers and very very important is the meniscus if both meniscus are gone you will still have pivoting if the lateral meniscus is gone or the root is gone in an acute setting you'll still have pivoting and you need to address that Meniscotibial ligaments, especially the ramp lesion, as, as shown wonderfully now by Dr. Dean Shaw, that is, has to be addressed. Unless you do not address this, your, your ACL is going to fail. Collaterals, especially the anterolateral capsule, the ALL capsule, and the Sigon's fracture, these are going to contribute to your rotational instability. Abnormal bony morphology, especially the slopes, and I think a wonderful demonstration was done. So if there is an abnormal slope, even that can contribute, especially in a division case. Hyperlaxity and hyperextension, we are going to quickly see to this. Now, when is a high-grade pure shift seen commonly? Preoperatively, if there is a chronic ACL tear, age more than 20 with pivoting sports injuries, female gender, concomitant ALC, the anterolateral corner injury on an MRI scan, and post-operatively, if the ACL is, your ACL is showing a high-grade pivoting, that means uh, there is going to be, uh, uh, especially in a hyper, uh, hyperextension case, then that is going to be a failure, a doom. Now, bony morphology, I think we have already seen. I'm not going to go into the details, but too much of a high slope or a, uh, 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 increase or a larger slope, both are going to be contributing to the pivoting and abnormal pivoting uh, of the lateral condyle, and that may cause uh, a pivot shift. So one needs to look into that as well. Now, how does a pure shift test help us? So it is going to preoperatively help us in diagnosis, 
and surgical planning. So if it is grade 2 or 3, we know that it is just not the ACL that we need to address, but we need to address the anterolateral corner as well. Post-operatively, you have to see your, your, your results, clinical outcomes by a pure shift test. And if there is a, a pure shift test which is positive after the ACL reconstruction would show a poorer results with subjective instability. And this also predicts that if it has been neglected, it will land into osteoarthritis of the knee. The surgical techniques which can aid to reduce the pure shift is of course taking care of, of the other injuries as we saw, the meniscus, the ram, the root and so on and so forth. But also it has been shown by recent papers that remnant preservation to a certain extent can contribute to reduce pivoting and of course a lateral extraarticular articular uh, can definitely help. Now in acute ACL with ALC combined injury treated with a combined ACLR means a reconstruction with LED reduces the entire translation and the rotational component. Acute isolated ACL injury treated with combined ACLR and LAT and would over constrict the result or the knee. So in a primary ACL without pivoting uh, LED is not indicated. So indications are revision, ACL high grade rotational instability, pivot shift grade 2 or 3, generalized laxity, genuine recurvatum more than 10, young patients going back to pivoting sports and mind you if there is a PLC or a lateral compartment OA or it can over constrain. Now what are the steps? Lateral, uh, that is the 90 degrees position, lateral um, aspect is that so you see the lateral epicondyle and the girdis tubercle take a, around 5 to 6 centimeter of incision, a 10 mm strip of ITB attached to the girdis tubercle, whip stitch with a nice thick fiber wire because the screw may cut through and then drill around 3 to 4 mm posterior and proximal to the lateral epicondyle that is what Laparat says. Go anterior and proximally so that you don't go into the intercondylar notch and doesn't interfere with the ACL tunnel and then fix it with a screw. So very quickly we'll see this uh, 30 seconds video and then I'll summarize. So around 5 to 6 centimeters incision, we take the 10 centimeters of the ITB band, let it attach to the girdis tubercle, come till the lateral epicondyle and it take another 2 centimeters more so that you get sufficient length in, uh, to go into the tunnel. The longer the better initially, be careful. Uh, not to damage the lower structures, identify the LCL, just make a little stitch or whip stitch it very well and then you have to go under the LCL, very important and LCL is easily felt and just do not get into the capsule, be extra capsular and uh, just pull it out below the LCL and we have already marked the point as I said proximal and distal to the lateral epicondyle. This is just a lateral epicondyle to mark <coughs> where it, it is, <coughs> just as a marker point and then there you go, posteriorly and slightly proximally with a K wire first, guide wire and then drill it, usually around uh, 6 mm and putting a screw of 7 uh, biabsorbable screws, that's what I do, depends on the, the, the size of the patient but this is what routinely I do. Fix it in extension certain uh, literature suggests uh, 30 degrees or 30 degrees of flexion in neutral you don't do not over constrain and uh, to summarize explosive pivoting is multifactorial it is just not the ALL it has to be many other things so the the clinical examination x-rays three Tesla MRI scan at the age of the patient the duration of ACL gender laxity, hyperextension, I mean sorry, generalized laxity, the gender, especially female, hyperextension, the tear of the meniscus, uh, whether it is the body or the root or the ramp, all these needs to be addressed. The pure shift test is very, very vital and that decides the LAT. LAT plus ACLR improves anterolateral and AP stability. LAT not beneficial when used for primary ACL less than one year without high pivoting, but definitely more than uh, one year old ACL uh, usually would have a stretched out uh, anterolateral complex and you'll need an LAT. Uh, LAT with ACLR did not result in increased rates of OA. The lit listened literature suggests that it is not this that is important, it is the meniscus that we need to address and the alignment that we need to address. That is what is going to cause the OA. LAT may be a graft protective uh, uh, mechanism and it reduces the graft uh, forces on the ACL. So 
uh, I'll summarize that LAT is also an important procedure one should know. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you indeed.